uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining the call. Um, so as last time, I'll, I will start off with some fairly standard didactic presentation, but also feel free to jump in at any point with questions. We might stay with the pure didactic for a while. Oh, I need to click on share. Hold on. Share. Great. Hopefully you can see my screen. So I will start off with the normal HUNET presentation, uh, but feel free to jump in because especially a lot of you already have experience and I want to make sure that your questions get answered. A lot of times when I do a basic presentation, I do focus on the high priorities, the most important points. There's limited time, people have different skills, but you're, a lot of you are past that. So sometimes I might skip over points that might be important for you. If I do, please stop me and I'm happy to address those as well. Um, so I thought that we could start off with just normal data entry and see uh, if we wanna go through all of that or take a break and move on to something else. And then I could start something similar with data analysis. I like as much as possible the idea of working with your data. Uh, many of you have been trained with my data set. It's gonna be the same points. Or uh, even if you have not trained with my data sets, your data will have different issues. And so we'll, I will try to incorporate that into the discussion of data analysis. Okay, great. Uh, and the sound quality, I hope, is okay? Yes, it's actually very good. Thank you. So I'll continue. Um, then it's a problem when everybody's on mute because sometimes I might talk for a long time, not realizing that nobody's there. Okay, I do need to move the GoToMeeting on my screen because it is obstructing my slides. Um, how do I move this? Okay, I'll put it in the lower right hand corner. And let me try to move this out of the way. It's a little ironic that you can see more of my screen than I can. <laughs> okay, I have now moved the, the meeting, the go to meeting controls out of the way. Okay, uh, let me go back to the beginning, first slide. So, HUNET data entry. There are basically two common ways to get the data into HUNET. Um, HUNET has three modules, interesting is data analysis, boring is data entry, and before that you do lab configuration to get everything set up. We've covered a lot of configuration on the last call. Uh, I will, if you have questions, I want to answer those, but let's hold off so we can get started on data entry. So it, you need to get the data into HUNET. The two ways to do that are by manual data entry, and that will be our focus for now. Somebody takes their paper notebooks, they go to the HUNET screen, and they just manually type the data out of the notebooks into the HUNET screen. The other approach is to download the data from an existing system. So if you have something like Polytech or Meditech or SunQuest or a Vitech or a Microscan or a Phoenix or Excel or some other source of data uh, in a sophisticated system or a basic system, if you already have some other system, we do not want you to manually retype the data into HUNET. Uh, some people do because they do not know about backlink or because they don't know how to export the data from their own system. But wherever possible, we want people who have IT systems to use backlink to get the data into HUNET. In that way, you can avoid the double data entry. You can often automate the process. So you can have automatic exports and automatic backlink. So those are the two ways to get the data into HUNET. Manual data entry out of notebooks or downloading the data from existing systems. In this call, we will focus on data entry, and at some later point, we will focus on backlink. So we will cover five points. Part one is how do you create a new data file? Just like in Word, just like in Excel, uh, if a file does not yet exist, you click on new Word document or new Excel document or new PowerPoint document. Similarly in HUNET, you will say create new data file, or if the file already exists, you will say open data file. Then we will go into the core of data entry, the manual typing of the data. Then we will view the database after you have entered five isolates or 20 isolates or 200 isolates, you would like to see what you did. Make sure the data is still there. Maybe do some editing. Maybe the doctor has given you a phone call and you want to look at the patient results. So you can view the database to do those things. You can also use it for clinical reports. Uh, many labs uh, use HUNET for clinical reporting, back to clinicians. Uh, they type the data into HUNET, they click on print report, and then they share the report with the doctors. Um, uh, there are things we'd like to do that to make that better and more complete and more useful. 
uh, but we provide it as is, and many people do find that useful. On the other hand, many labs just already have some way of reporting. They have a lab information system that prints out clinic reports, or they have paper reports. The doctor sends in a, in a, a request for testing. The lab writes the results on that request form and then sends the request form back to the doctor. But if you would like to use TuneIn for clinical reporting, it is one of the options. It's okay, and we would like to make it better. And then finishing up to move on to eventually data analysis. Um, occasionally, after several slides, I will pause to ask if there are any questions. I will not ask at the end of each slide. Uh, but of course, jump in at any point if you do want me to stop and answer a question right there. Okay, step one, creating a new data file. You start HUNET and select your laboratory. That could be the WHO test hospital. That could be your data. That could be some other data configuration. Uh, so when you open HUNET, you see a list of defined laboratories. Select one of them and click on Open Laboratory. And then after you do this, you will be on the HUNET main screen. And at the top of the screen, you will see uh, data entry, data analysis, help. So you click on the data entry option. You'll see several features there, such as new file, open file, uh, export data, combined data. So we will go through some of these additional features later. At the beginning of this presentation, the first time, we will choose that first option called new data file. And here's the menu. Uh, these slides I think I mentioned on a previous pre uh, slide on a previous presentation, we're prepared in India. Whoever made these slides used Tunet 5.4, which I have not seen in a very long time, but everything is almost identical. Uh, we have added, we have deleted a few things, so these slides do need to be updated. Uh, but uh, right now, we are doing so many big changes uh, that we're just waiting to update these until the new software is, is stable with regard to new menu features. Okay. So you see the first two options are new data file and open data file. Of course, the first time you open it, you choose native, new data file. Subsequently, you either choose open, open data file like you see here, or at the bottom of this, this menu, you will see the list of the most recently open files. Word and Excel do the same thing. When you want to open an Excel file, you can use open file, but Excel and Word are also very helpful. They do show you the list of the most recently open files just to save you time in, in finding files that already exist. I will now continue. So creating a new data file. A data file has, every file you have ever made has two key characteristics. What is the name of the file and where did you save it? <laughs> Sometimes people write to me, John, I lost my data. And one of the most common reasons they quote unquote lost their data is they just don't know where the data are. They're in some other folder, they're on some drive, they're on, you know, uh, they, move, they change computers and they want to move everything from computer one to computer two. So please, just like any important Word or PowerPoint or Excel document, please remember what you called the file and where you put the file. Hunet is automatically suggesting uh, a location. Hunet's default location is in the Hunet data folder. It's a nice, simple option. It's a nice, simple approach that most users around the world, when they save HUNET files, they go into the folder called HUNET, or in this case, HUNET 5, data. So if you do that, it's easy for me to tell you where to look for your files. But not everybody does that. Some people put them in HUNET data, and then they create subfolders for different years, 2019, 2020, 2021. So they are within the data folder, but within additional subfolders that they have created. Or many people put the data on to a common network drive. I do like that. If you have a, a T drive or a P drive or an S drive, we'd like to have the data on the network drive for two main reasons. One is that everybody with WhoNet, with the proper credentials and username and password, is able to use exactly the same files. I can be sitting at computer A in the laboratory, and somebody else can be considering a computer B or C or D, and the data entry person sits at one computer to enters the data, but anybody else who has permission can use those same files. So that's one of the reasons why I like a network installation of WhoNet. People are using the same files, they can use the same configurations, the same software, so you only need to maintain the system on one computer 
and all the data are on that computer. The second reason why I like data on the network drive is about backups. Many people are, base, are bad about backing up their own data. Sometimes people write to me, John, I lost my data. And sometimes the reason they lost the data is the computer got lost, the computer got damaged, or the computer got stolen. Um, uh, the computer got reformatted. I can't, re we cannot retrieve those data. The data are physically gone. Uh, of course, no matter where you save the data, you should be backing up your data. Back, the, back them up to a memory stick, back them up to a, a CD drive, back them up to another computer. Um, so no matter where you decide to save your files, make sure that you have a good backup strategy. Uh, many people do back up their data on memory sticks and CD-ROMs. Keep in mind that is not so secure because memory sticks and CD-ROMs also get lost. They get misplaced. And then whoever finds it might be able to access your patient confidential data if the CD-ROM or if the pass or if the memory stick does not have a password. So I please insist, please have backup strategies. When people tell me they lost their data and it is the data are lost, it's heartbreaking. They put in so much effort to put all those data in, and then the data have been lost. Another common reason people lose the data is they had somebody there for five years, they managed all the data, and then that person leaves. One year later, somebody else comes in to want to continue, and they just can't find the data. It's not that the data are lost, but nobody knows where the data were stored previously. So please have a strategy for backing up your files. I mentioned that I do like the idea of having data on the network drive. The reason for that is network drive IT people are usually pretty good about backing up the network drive. If you keep the data on your local hard drive, it is your personal responsibility to have a backup plan. But if you keep the data on the network drive, and if you trust your IT department, hopefully they have a good backup strategy. So if you did lose something, talk to the IT department and hopefully they can get it back for you. So uh, if you're using Hunet on a single computer, most people just put the data into the Hunet data folder, or maybe they create some subfolders, either by lab or by year, or both. But if you are on a network, it does make sense to put the data onto a network drive. So that's about the file location. Where are you saving your data? And then what name should you give to the data file? Uh, give it any name you want, any valid name for Windows. Hunet does suggest a very simple name. For example, W for Hunet, 2020 for the year, Ethiopia or ETH for the country, dot hospital 001, hospital BWH, hospital, you know, whatever your laboratory codes are. So who knows just a nice simple name uh, for, uh, you know, for the file. But you can give it a different name. You might want the data by month. You might want the data by blood or by urine or by project. We have a two month project. Let's put the data for those for that project, the pneumococcal study into that one file. So please give names that mean something to you. Don't give a file a name like data because you don't know what year, what lab. Try to have the name of the file be meaningful to tell you what years it is, what project it is, what months it is. There's a small point I'm going to come back to later. Um, I often find it easiest to manage the data by year. You have one big file for the year. Uh, in January, you have a file called 2020. In March, you have a file called 2020, which is the same file, but it's bigger. So at the beginning of the year, you just create one file, and through the year, the file gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So at the end of the year, you have 2020 complete. It's a nice, easy, convenient way. That time, every time they send you the 2020 data, you simply replace the one that they sent you previously. Having said that, I personally don't usually replace it, but the one they sent me previously, I just put in an archive folder. If they send me something, I don't like to delete it, but I'll just move it away. I often have one folder for archive, permanent records of what people have sent me. But then I'll have a different folder for active analysis and cleaning that is my, my, the one I use for analyses. Okay, uh, a small point I will come back to later is many people do save their data by month. They have a file for January, a file for February, a file for March. Nothing wrong with that. It does mean you have a lot of additional files to track. Um, one small recommendation, M many people, when they have data for January, they will put the name J-A-N in the file. For example, 2020, January, or they'll just type the word January. 
they'll type the word January, the word February, or they'll put abbreviation like SEP for September. I do not recommend that. The reason is just out of convenience. Uh, I have a simple question, but it's a trick question. What is the first month of the year? Of course, many of you will say January, but that's not true in alphabetical order. In alphabetical order, the first month of the year is April, followed by, I'm not sure, August. So when you use the words January, February, March, when you look at Windows, the files will be listed in month order alphabetically. So if you see that you have 10 months and two of the months are missing, it's easy to know which month is missing if you use numbers. 01 for January, 02 for February. So if you're using the months, then it's easier, easiest to know which two months are missing. So it's a small thing, but in the long term, I suggest avoid the word Jan and just put the number 01. Or you can invo avo avoid all of this completely by just having one big file for the year 2020. I don't have a strong recommendation. There are good reasons why people do it different ways. Uh, but you should come up to some standard and try to get the labs to comply with those standards. It will simply make your work at the national level easiest. I don't want hospital one to do one thing, hospital two to do another thing, hospital three. Um, so try to standardize it as much as possible. It just makes the national data management easier, easier to find mistakes, for example, or missing data. Okay. So in Hunet, you give it a name, you give it a path, and you click on OK. If the file exists already, Hunet will warn you, this file already exists. Do you want to replace it? Uh, so usually for new data file, usually you don't want to replace an existing file. So if Hunet warns you, you're about to get rid of something, please take a moment to think about if you want to delete something that exists already. Okay. Great. So and here's what I'm talking about. Um, uh, the screen actually has been modernized. But here it says W4 Hunet, 01 for January, 06 for the year 2006, the WHO test country, and the WTH, uh, you know, WHO tutorial hospital, as an example, file name. And you can save the data by year, by month, or you just type something else. By default, you see the data are saved in the Hunet data folder. Good. So now you would be in the Hunet data entry screen, which is probably on the next screen here, yes. So this is what the data entry screen looks like. At the top, you see the first question is human, or the, is origin, but you can change that to human, animal, or food. You put in the identification number, last name, first name, sex, et cetera. You put in the location details in the second box, specimen details in the third box, microbiology results, including the organism antibiotic results, and then finally, other. Uh, if we were sitting down together in a big room during a live training course, I would ask you to manually enter these data in so that you could actually just practice yourself with data entry. We're not going to do that now because after the PowerPoint, we will do a live data entry. So, uh, so I'll just show you what they did here. Please type in the patient ID, one, two, three, four, five. Patient name, John Smith. Male, birthday, neurology, specimen number, specimen date blood, staph aureus, beta lactamase positive, and then the zone diameters for the distiffusion results. As it says here on the slide, as you enter the zone diameters, HUNET will automatically tell you if it is resistant, intermediate, or susceptible because HUNET knows the breakpoints. HUNET does not require zone diameters. HUNET does not require MIC values, but we do strongly recommend them, and I will come back to that in a few more slides. HUNET does accept the letters R, I, and S, if you do not have measurements, then Hunet has no trouble with that. But the quality of the data is compromised. There's less you can do if you do not have the measurements. We'll come back to that in a few more slides. So here's the data entry screen. As I said, you just type that information in. If we were doing a, an in-person workshop, I would stop at this point and have people you know, enter in some test results. Here at the bottom, you see it says Staph aureus. The letters are SAU. The cefoxitin result is 20, followed by the letter S. That's a sensitive result. Here on the right, it has you know, the, the breakpoint. So with the breakpoints, who knows, is it resistant, intermediate, or susceptible? At the end of this, you click on Save Isolate. Later, we will talk about View Database. We'll talk about Backtrack Summary a little bit. Print Clinical Report, Exit, Caliper, or Clear just to erase everything on the screen. 
But right now we have finished manually entering our data and we click on Save Isolate. Um, we'll talk about date formats later. Do you want month, day, year, day, month, year? Um, so we'll talk about that when we get to data entry. Okay. So data entry, in Hunet, you can either enter the measurements or the interpretations, but we strongly recommend that you put the measurements in for a few reasons. For me, really, the most important reason is to get the correct result. There is an alternate quote-unquote method that is extremely common called the eyeball method. Eyeball method is terrible. You pick up the plate, you pick up the distribution plate, you look at the zones of inhibition, and you say to yourself, oh, that's a small zone diameter. I think that's resistant. And someone says, I disagree with you. I've been here longer than you. I think it's sensitive. They did not take out a ruler. They did not take out the tables. Nobody really knows. And this unfortunate eyeball method is very common. Of course, if a bacteria is highly resistant or very sensitive, they, they should get the correct result. Basically, anything below 10 is resistant. Anything above 25 is sensitive. But in between 14 and 25, it could be resistant, it could be intermediate, it could be sensitive. Depends on the organism, depends on the antibiotic, it depends on the year because these breakpoints can change. So please, please, please measure. So there are sick people at the end, at the other end of this plate. We took this sample out of a patient, we put it into a plate. If the, the patient suffered from their disease, taking of a sample, transporting the sample, it is the laboratory's job to do the best job possible to give the doctor a reliable result. And if you simply use your eye to give the doctor a, a reliable result, it won't be reliable. And certainly, sometimes you make the mistake that the bacteria is really sensitive, but the lab says resistant. That's unfortunate because it's an antibiotic that the doctor could have used. Uh, but they didn't because the lab incorrectly said it was resistant. That is what we call a major error. There's something even worse called a very major error. A very major error would happen if the bacteria is really resistant, but the lab said, oh, it's sensitive. This is, the, this is a bigger mistake than the first example I told you because the lab might say that there's ampicillin sensitive and the doctor decides to give the patient ampicillin and then the patient may die because it was really ampicillin resistant. So if you're simply using your eye to estimate R, I, and S, um, it's, you're not gonna get the right result. There will be many cases, especially with low level moderate resistance. And a lot of resistance, a lot of important resistance is moderate level. ESBL resistance, quinolone resistance, carbapenem resistance is often not high level resistance. So please measure to give the doctor correct information for patient care. That's reason number one. Reason number two, I like the breakpoints. These breakpoints can change over time. Uh, if there is a change of the breakpoints, you cannot compare your old data and your new data. Maybe in 2015, the correct interpretation was resistant. Or uh, more commonly, maybe in that year, the correct interpretation was sensitive. But sometimes breakpoints change, especially to become more resistant. A good example of this was around 10 years ago with carbapenems. There was very little carbapenem resistance in the world, very little imipenem resistance. And, um, and I worked with one of the states in the United States and they thought that they only had three examples of imipenem resistant E. coli. I will abbreviate that CRE, carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae. In the whole state, they thought they only had three. But then CLSI realized that the breakpoints were in the wrong place. When I applied the new breakpoints to their old data, because I did have the interpret, I did have the measurements, I found that they had about 25. So the problem was much more common than they realized because they were using the older breakpoints. And the newer breakpoints were better at finding the, the, the resistance. So if I because I had the measurements, I was able to compare the old data and the new data. But if they only gave me R's, I's, and S's, I, I would just have to say, yes, the breakpoint has changed, but I don't know if it impacted my statistics or not. Some people wonder why do breakpoints change? Um, and also, as a, a, along the same lines, if I am analyzing data today in 2020, if I am analyzing data from 2010, I should not be using the 2010 breakpoints. I should be using today's breakpoints. 
people say, but we did the test in 2010. Why are we not using the 2010 breakpoints? The reason for that is because the test hasn't changed. The test we did in 2010 is the same test we did today. What has changed is our understanding of what is resistant and what is susceptible. So for the test we did in 2010, it's the same test we're doing today. So please use today's breakpoints for that. Um, so for example, in EarsNet, if they are reporting data in 2020, they recommend either using the 2020 breakpoints or practically maybe the 2019 breakpoints because not everybody has the 2020 breakpoints yet. But they want to use, the point is they want to use recent breakpoints. Either this year's most up-to-date breakpoints, that is the CLSI recommendation, or last year's breakpoints, which are pretty close. Um, let's see. I'll also detour a bit. This is important more for data analysis than data entry. In fact, it's not important for data entry. But since I'm on the subject of measurements, um, some people wonder, well, if it was quote unquote sensitive in 2010, why would it be resistant today? The bacteria hasn't changed. This comes to an underlying misunderstanding of what breakpoints are about. The purpose of breakpoints, ironically, is not to find resistance. Uh, many of you may think that's a strange statement to make, but the truth is that the purpose of these breakpoints is not to find resistance genes, it's not to find a little bit of resistance. The purpose of these breakpoints is to predict the clinical outcome. In other words, if the patient has this strain, the strain might be a little bit resistant. And there are many examples where there is low level resistance where the patient would still get better. So that's why we're not looking for resistance, we're trying to predict the clinical outcome. So in the example I mentioned with imipenem resistance, there were bacteria that were a little bit resistant and CLSI said, you know, they are a little bit resistant, but based on our pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic data, we think the patient would still get better. We think there's enough concentration to overwhelm the resistance. And then in 2010, they realized they were wrong. And they said, oh, you know, this little bit of resistance is important. So it's not as if from, it's the, so basically, even though we thought it was sensitive in 2010, what we really meant is we thought the patient was going to get better. Whereas today we realize there's more clinical data, the patient will not get better. So the best way to understand this is that we're not trying to find resistant genes. We're trying to predict if the patient would get better or not. And that's why these breakpoints change. And that's why sometimes the, the breakpoints become more resistant. Things that we thought were not important are important. About two years ago, the floor, or maybe even last year, the fluoroquinolone resistance breakpoints changed a lot because we used to think that low-level resistance was not important. And now they realize it is important. Um, okay, I'll continue. So we like the measurements because breakpoints change over time. Reason number three is the measurements really help you a lot to look at data quality. We will talk about that more when I get to data analysis. And by reviewing, and then in the fourth reason here, you can, if you have a high level resistance or low level resistance, the doctor doesn't care if, because you're not gonna give that drug to a patient. If you tell the doctor your patient has high level cipro resistance, or low level Cipro resistance. Either way, the doctor is not going to use Cipro for the patient decision. But it is valuable for epidemiology, knowing about resistance mechanisms. It's valuable to infection control. If you have two patients in the same room, and if one patient is high level resistance and the other patient is low level resistance, and if I trust my laboratory, it's just two different strains. There's not a transmission. They just have two different bacteria. One of them is high level resistant, one of them is low level resistance. But if the two patients have the same organism, the, both of them have high level resistance and both of them have low level resistance, I'm very worried about a transmission that maybe the patient in bed A infected the patient from bed B or a doctor or a nurse or the door handle infected both of the people. So these measurements and high level resistance and low level resistance give us a better understanding of the underlying molecular epidemiology. The best way to know if two patients have the same thing is to do molecular typing. But molecular typing, like sequencing, molecular typing is expensive, it takes time, it takes money, expertise, equipment, but we don't have that routinely. Maybe in 10 years, but no, we don't have that today. But we do have the zone diameter measurements. So these are four reasons why I like the measurements. One, it's the correct way to give the doctor the correct results. Two, the breakpoints might change over time, so the measurements allow you to compare your old data and new data. Three, the measurements allow you to look at data quality much better. And four, it allows you to separate high level resistance from low level resistance as a way to do phenotypic tracking. 
now there's a fifth reason because of this concept of one health now that people are looking at food and animal and human and environmental samples um there are different breakpoints if it's a cat or a sheep or a dog um, and in that case you need the measurement if it's a cat you give this person interpretation if it's a dog you give this interpretation and you need the measurement to do that if you want if you take an isolate from a cat but you want to compare it with the human results you want to use the human breakpoints so with the measurement you can apply all of the different relevant breakpoints depending on what your need is i'm going to hit enter okay. i'll stop right there for a moment are there any questions on anything i've covered so far i'll just count to five myself internally okay i'll assume that's no questions I'm going to go back a little bit. So all of you already saw this screen. In the upper right-hand corner, it says Save Isolate. As soon as I click on Save Isolate, there, you will get this. You know, you'll get this screen. Do you want to save the isolate and start a new one? Do you Do want you to save have it? a question? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Hmm. Uh, I don't know whether uh, you see it our annual report. Uh, I think the whole report is based on uh, qualitative result. It is yes. only said the resistance intermediate or uh, susceptible. Uh, do you think the test measure can improve our report for the coming year? Because we have to also go to into details. Some epidemiologists comment as uh, you have to go to the patient level, all these kind of things. So really, can you? Again, explain if the test measurement is useful uh, to, uh, I mean, to write our annual report, our MR surveillance report. Currently, Actually, it's sorry. qualitative, yeah. I'm oh, sorry, was there a second question? That's qualitative. No, no, this is the first question. And the, I mean, the second question is about data entry. One of yes. our major problem is the communication with the doctors. Yes. Do you think this manual entry can uh, facilitate the communication between physicians and the lab. Is there any mechanism that we can uh, facilitate without using uh, other uh, data source like uh, Polytech or whatever we have? Sure, let me answer the first question first about the annual report. Um, yeah. So I'm closely working now with Vietnam, Sri Lanka, uh, Laos, and a few other countries to develop standard reports for analysis. Oh. And Hunet already has a feature called standard reports. It's an old feature that we will be expanding. So now with the Fleming Fund, we are going to make a lot of modifications to expand Hunet standard reports. We're distinguishing between a few kinds of reports. And uh, so I'll tell you a few kinds of reports. One kind of report is a data submission report. If somebody gives me their data for January, I want to give that lab feedback about their data set. I want to say thank you. I want to say mm -hmm. you, you 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 have put in the patient's gender 95% of the time. Excellent. You have pitched the patient's age in 20% of the time. So it's basically a feedback report. Uh, I have to sneeze. Sorry. Uh, hold on. <laughs> Usually three times. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, I'm finished. Um, so. Um, Okay, so um, so so one kind of standard report is a feedback report. Thank you for your data. You gave me a hundred isolates. It was twenty percent complete, eighty percent complete. I found these strange results. We did not test any penum. I would have suggested you do that. So one kind of important report is is a report that the laboratory can generate on their own, but also that you at the national level can provide to them. Thank you for the January data this looks great this looks unusual this looks wrong please make the following improvements this kind of feed report is not useful for the general stakeholder it's useful for the lab to make to try to help them improve their testing on a month-to-month -month basis the data quality test quality report data volume report that's one kind of report another kind of report again hospital specific is trending over time you know, if they give me their June data, I will give them a detailed feedback report on the June data with June data alone. 
but I also want to give them a second set of reports comparing the June data to the January to May data. You know, in June, did the total number of isolates drop? Did the percent resistance go up? Did the data completeness get better or get worse? So these are two kinds of facility-specific reports. And for the facility-specific reports, you can also give them a score on how well they did data completeness. Did they do measurements? It's a quality measure. So I would, for that purpose, in the feedback, give them feedback on that. And then the time trend report to see if things are getting better or worse, either epidemiologically or data quality-wise, lab quality-wise. Other kinds of reports are meant more for the stakeholders, the pharmacists, the epidemiologists, the, med the news media, general advocacy, general awareness. At that high level, the zoned amateurs are not so important. So many countries like Philippines spend, spend a lot of time and effort on the measurements, but the measurements do not end up in the annual report, or they might end up in the annual report on a section dedicated on, on either one of two areas. One section in the annual report might be data quality and completeness measures. And you can have that, you know, that 80% of these were measurements and 20% of these were not measurements. So they use it as a quality metric. That's one way they met the measurements might end up in the annual report. And the other thing might be something very specific like imipenem resistance. Because imipenem resistance, there are different mechanisms. There's carbapenemase production, there's poor and loss, and this will often be reflected in the measurement high level resistance, moderate resistance, decreased susceptibility. So for the general average stakeholder for most things, there often will be no measurement, no mention of the measurements. It might be in there at the highest level for a quality metric. It also might be there for a very specific molecular issue like low to medium to high level resistance. But generally speaking, we don't use the measurements at the highest level. We do use the measurements internally within the network to improve the quality and interpretation. I'll give you one example of this from one country in Latin America. Uh, I'll just simplify the story, but basically we found that some labs had a lot more aminoglycoside resistance than other labs. When we looked at the zone diameter distribution, what we noticed is that the sensitive bacteria in some hospitals was shifted to the left for the zone diameters. In other words, what I'm saying is around the world, the, sense, the resistant bacteria around the world are different, but the sensitive mm. bacteria around the world are relatively similar. So some of the labs had the sensitive bacteria in the expected range, like 20 to 25 millimeters, but some labs had the same sensitive bacteria, like 17 to 22. The whole breakpoint range had shift, was shifted down, and they ended up with a lot more resistance because a lot of their sensitive bacteria were incorrectly in the intermediate zone. When we investigated even further, we found that these labs were, were getting their medium from the same manufacturer. And so basically we were able to use the zone diameters to find bad quality medium, to have good results, especially for something like aminoglycosides. If you're familiar with the word amino, amino NH2, NH3, uh, is high positively charged. So um, some things like that are positively charged are very impacted by the medium of the pH, the pH of the medium and the calcium magnesium concentration of the medium. And so we went to this manufacturer and said the pH or something is wrong. Your labs are giving smaller than expected measurements for the amino glycosides. So this is simply an example where we use the measurements to find a specific issue in the quality of either the disks or the quality of the medium. So that's using the measurements for quality objectives. Or as I said earlier, if you're looking for outbreaks or if you're looking for high level resistance, low level resistance. So these are very valuable scientifically, but often you do not mention these. You might put these into a publication, but usually they're not in my usual annual report for most stakeholders. Yeah. Is that a reasonable answer for the first question about the reports? Yeah, so you advise to use uh qualitative uh, data that is resistance uh, intermediate or uh, susceptible for the reporting. Is different reports. For the typical annual report that we plan to share outside of the network, uh, yeah, for them, yes. our I and S is typically sufficient. Okay, thank you. I do use the measurements for other things, valuable okay. things, 
but I just don't put them in the annual report for everybody. I put those in specialized reports. Okay. Your second question about communications. I'm not sure exactly what you mean, but um, let's see. The WhoNet is used by many laboratories for clinical reporting. So you take the results from the paper notebook, you manually type them into WhoNet, you print out the clinical report, and then you give that document back to the back to the doctor. Um, so let's see. Um, so in that way, it, it's improving communication. They have a nice standard printout. Um, uh, WhoNet, WhoNet reports can be saved as uh, um, something like a PDF file. So it does raise the possibility you could save the report and email it to somebody. So that could be useful. You can do the clinical report with WhoNet, print it out onto paper, or save it to a file, and then email it to somebody. That's one way to improve communications. Another way, especially if you have the data on a network drive, is you might have the people in the lab do the manual data entry, but you might have a secretary up front um, who is doing the clinical reporting. So I was at a laboratory in Bhutan, and they were doing, before we set up the network drive, they have a system. Um, I had forgotten about this. They have Polytech. I forgot about this. They have Polytech. Uh, and in a similar situation to you, they were using Polytech for all of the labs, except mm -hmm. for microbiology. <laughs> they just said it wasn't adequate for a lot of their needs. So what was happening is, for all chemistry and blood bank and other results, patients would go to the hospital lobby, and the person in the hospital lobby could look up all of the results except for microbiology because they're not in the system. So for microbiology, the patients had to walk up to the laboratory. That's a pain in the neck for the laboratory because they're constantly being interrupted by patients asking for their test results. So when I was there, I helped to set them up the Polytech, not the Polytech, Hunet on the network drive. So the lab would enter the results manually into Hunet, but the person downstairs in the hospital lobby could look up the results. So this was a big change for them because it meant that all patients could get their Polytech and Hunet results in the lobby. They did not have to walk up to the laboratory. Uh, so this is a second example. Eventually, we do plan to have a web-based version of Hunet, uh, both an intranet version and an internet version. Well, of course, it's the same version. But you can put you can put the web version on of Hunet when it when it will exist on the hospital intranet, meaning that anybody inside the hospital firewall would be able to look up the results, but if they have the username and password. So this would be useful because uh, right now doctors come down to the lab or they call the lab, they come down to the lab. I've seen this many times in in Fiji. They were using they are using a system called Starlims, but not for microbiology. And so for all of the labs, they can go on the floor and look at the results. In fact, in Fiji, they have this wonderful system that around the country, no matter what island they are on, there's a web-based system for looking up results, except for microbiology, because the microbiology is done manually uh, in paper, paper systems. Again, they just didn't like it for microbiology. So I was able to help them resolve these issues to get Hunet and integrate it with their web interface. So um, this is ways of improving communication so that the clinicians, and I understand that, that uh, the Black Lion Hospital, is they do have a system that any physician in the hospital can look up all of the chemistry results and blood bank results, but not microbiology. So regarding Black Lion, I do recognize that it might be more work for the labs to en start entering the results into Polytech or Hunet, but it's not only about the lab, it's not only about their workload, you have to consider the workload of the clinicians. If clinicians are walking down to the lab, bringing their infected hands with them, not washing their hands, looking at the notebooks, and then they go back to see their patients without washing their hands, there's a lot of risk of contagion there. Um, so if you can replace that, and, and or the other option is they call, they call the lab. Calling the lab is just a big interruption to laboratory work. Um, so at the Black Lion, there's a very powerful incentive, I would hope, to get people to digitize the microbiology data. Uh, so that physicians could simply look at the microbiology results just like they do for the other laboratories. So these are some different ways that you can use WhoNet. Once we have a web version of WhoNet, it will be even more valuable because on the intranet, then people can look it up. But Blackline doesn't need that because they already have an intranet system of that nature. But if they use Polytech and they interfaced it, then physicians could do it that way. So I hope that those are some, some answers to your questions on communications. 
Maybe yes. Uh, Great. Yes, John. Uh, I can understand. Uh, save and email to a physician. This is a uh, 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 very understandable. And also the web based is also. We are trying to have that web based, but still. As I said before, we don't have Polytech all across the country. But the second uh, option, the second, uh, I mean, uh, uh, solution you suggested, network drive, that's not clear for me. Oh, the first one is clear. You can save and email to a physician. And the web based is also very clear because if it is interfaced, everybody can access. But the, the last one is not clear. The network drive, drive how they can share. Uh, this information or our communication is facilitated through this. Can you again repeat this one? Sure, sure. Um, and also, I forgot to mention the new Polytech web version. Right now, I talked to Jeff Fisher, you know, the company owner and president, uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, uh, one focus of their web work is COVID, so that people around the country can enter their COVID results. But it's still the web platform. Um, and ideally, with the web platform, you can look at the other results and chemistries and blood banks and microbiology results. So this can be a wonderful opportunity with the web version for doctors logging in to see all of the results, no matter where they are in the country. And it would be a shame, just like the Fiji situation, it'd be a shame if they could log in and see all of the patient results, except for microbiology. This would not be a problem for mm -hmm. EPHI results because your, poly, your microbiology data are in Polytech. So it should be possible for doctors to look up their microbiology results. But for Black Lion, the doctors would be able to look up all of the chemistry, hematology, blood banks, serology, but not microbiology because it's not in the system. So especially once the Polytech web version is further implemented and further integrated, that would be an additional powerful reason to try to get the microbiology in that would greatly improve physicians' access to data. Okay. Regarding your point about the network drive, yeah, sure. Um, you know, so basically, if I want to give access to microbiology results to 100 people, the web solution would be the best because you have basically you have the server that everybody is looking up. You just need all of the computers around the hospital to have an internet connection so they can look up the results. So if I have 100, 200, 500 people, the intranet version would, would be great. Because anybody with an intranet web connection should be able to use that system. For a, a desktop application like Kunet, that's not a very convenient solution. What they would have to do, if you wanted 500 people to have access to it, for a web version, that's easy. You just give them intranet web access. Uh, you only have to maintain the server and the web connection. But if you wanted to give 500 people access to Hunet as a desktop application, you would need to go to all 500 computers and install Hunet separately. So that's why if you want to give Hunet access to all the physicians, the web version would be much better, you know, once we, once we eventually get back to it, because uh, I don't want to install Hunet on 500 computers and then maintain it, just too much work to do that. But if you want to install Hunet on five computers or 10 computers or 20 computers, that's much more manageable. Okay, so basically what if I have, uh, let's just say that I have maybe three computers in microbiology, two computers in the laboratory administration, and maybe two computers in the infection control office, and maybe two computers in the infectious disease department. So there might be 10 computers where I want to give these 10 people access to Hunet. So what I do is I go separately to each of the 10 computers. I install Hunet. I have the Hunet look at the common network drive, the T drive or the P drive. So I can have, I can put the data onto the network drive. So if I am sitting in the lab at computer number one, when I click on save isolate, the screen that's in front of us, when I click on save isolate, it won't save it on the hard drive. It will save the data immediately to, let me say the P drive. Um, so it will save the data to the P drive. But then somebody in infection control or in pharmacy, they have access to the same Hunet, they have access to the same P drive, so they can look up the results even though they're in a different part of the hospital. So as long as they're on an intranet with access to the same network drive, they can see everything that the lab people can see. The disadvantage with desktop Hunet is if you have 10 computers, 
somebody has to walk to the 10 computers. Walking to 10 computers is not a big deal, <laughs> but walking to 500 computers is a big deal. So, so, so for 500 people, the web server version would be much better. But for 10 people, somebody goes to computer one and sets it up, then they go to computer five and set it up. They walk over to the pharmacy and set it up. They walk to the infection control office and they set it up. So the data are residing on the network drive. So one group enters the data, either by manual data entry or by using backlink, but then anybody who has access to the network drive um, you know, would have access to the data. Right now, the data that we discussed would be on the C drive Hunet data folder, but it doesn't have to be the C drive Hunet data folder. It could be the P drive Hunet data folder. So anybody who is given access to the P drive Huna data folder can do everything that the lab people can do. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I'm going to take a little detour, and I just want to emphasize this point. Um, here's my Huna 2020. And the network drive, it's all easy. I don't want to make this sound more complicated than it is. If I go to data entry, new data file, you see that at the top of the screen, Hunet wants to save it in the C drive Hunet data folder. But I could save it on the W drive or the Z drive or the T drive. Uh, uh, you see the red X here that these are my net hospital network drives. I'm not in the hospital right now. I am not on the VPN. So that's why it says an X. But if I said here W, well, it's telling me I'm not inside the hospital right now. But instead of saving it on the C drive, I can simply save it on the network drive. So in Hunet, it's not complicated. It just means I need to go to. I need to install Hunet on my work computer. I need to install Hunet on my home computer. I need to install Hunet on maybe five or 10 computers. And then each of those computers, I say the same W drive. Okay. Um, so that's how we can choose at the time of data entry. Hunet also has this nice feature under file settings. So Hunet by default, the data will be in the Hunet data folder. But it is configurable. I don't have to put them into C drive. I can put them in the P drive. Or it doesn't have to be called Hunet data. It can be called, um, it doesn't have to be called Hunet data. It can be called Hunet data 2020, Hunet data 2019. So you can choose exactly what drive and what folder you want it to be saved in. So basically, I explained that to you in words with my PowerPoint. But I also wanted to show you that inside of Hunet, it's extremely simple. Instead of saying the C drive, you simply just choose some other location. You know, maybe I want to put it on the desktop, and then I put it here under stuff, and I put it wherever. Um, so, is that clear? So, if you had in the lab five computers, just simply install Hunet on the five computers, and then save the data on some drive that they all have common access to. Any other questions? Otherwise, I will go back to the PowerPoint. Maybe uh, I have one simple question. Yes. Yeah. While you are saving the data, sometimes uh, you know we are looking error code something, error code seventy two, and the like. So, what is the the reason behind looking this kind of error? I'm sorry, you said urine 72? You said there's a number? Yeah, error, error code 72, something like that. For the when we are saving. No, 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 no. Just generally, while you are saving or opening the Hunet uh, software, you will get uh, sometimes error code 72. Oh, error, error, error code. Error code. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Error, error means an error. Um, yeah. So that means we need. I need to work with you to figure out the cause of the error. I'm just going to do a search. Error seventy two. It's probably not seventy two. Error seventy two um, looks like something with Adobe. So, so basically, who net? Let's see. I'll come up with an example. Um, Uh, I'll, I'll show you an example. Um, let's see. I got an email today. In fact, I was answering this email when you called. Uh, this is from Greece um, here. So here, this kind of thing, error number. OK. You can still see my screen. I hope it says error number 99. Yes, we can see it, John. 
great, great, great. Um, and you see, then the number, the number of person doesn't mean a lot to me. The next thing down is the description. Here it says external component has thrown an extent an exception. That tells me there's some compatibility issue. We're trying to do something that's not compatible on their computer. And then we need to figure out what it is, and is there something we can do to avoid this compatibility issue? Let me make that bigger so it's easier to read. It tells me the error number, which I mostly ignore, uh, and it tells the error description associated with that number. So these two things are linked together. The external component has thrown an exception. It tells me that this happened uh, during import routines, specifically in a subroutine called import read file. You give some other information. So if you are getting these error messages, also if I go to, I don't know if I have any here, would you see that on the screen? Yeah, here are error logs. So these error logs tell, in fact, I can delete these. So, so you see here, this error log says 2020-0511. So that, this error was generated on the year 2020, May 11th at 11.38 in the morning. So when I open this file, it tells me what it saw on the screen. So if you want to sh tell me something, um, sometimes people tell me, John, there's an error in Hunet. That is a little helpful, but it's not very helpful. I need more details. <laughs> what was the error number? What was the error message? Um, these additional details that we can generate. What were you doing? Were you in data analysis? Were you in data entry? So these, so Hunet tells you the information on the screen. So you can send us a screen capture. Or you can send us the error file. Don't send us all the error files. Just send us the most, the, the one, like the most, like here I had the same error probably three times in a row. I had the problem at 11.38 in the morning, 11.40, and then again at 11.41, if I open that up. Uh, you know, it's, you know, the error message. In this case, well, so it, this gives me the details of the message. So in answer, I can't answer your question right now in a specific sense. What I can tell you is if you get an error message, please tell me that error message. And then we can explain why you are getting that error message. Sometimes it has to do the network drive is not accessible. The network drive is down. Of course, there's going to be an error. Um, it should not happen routinely. The, the two basic reasons for an error are either that there is a mistake inside of Hunet or there is some local problem. If it's a mistake inside of Hunet, we do want to fix that. Uh, well, there's sort of three kinds of issues. Um, one is there is a problem, an intrinsic problem in Hunet. Another is there's something very specific that laboratory people did wrong, or the network is down, or there's some of their error, something other unexpected thing. There's something in the middle, like these compatibility issues, like that message I showed you for Greece. There's not something specifically wrong with Hunet, but there is some compatibility issue on their computer. It's not their fault, it's not exactly our fault, but we have to we have to search for Google to see if we can understand the compatibility issue, if there's some way to get around the compatibility issue. So if you send me those error log files, then we can start having a discussion with you. So we can, first of all, have a diagnosis. Why are you getting that error? And secondly, uh, you know, secondly, a, a discussion. Uh, you know, secondly, uh, uh, you know, first of all, a diagnosis, and secondly, um, a solution. Okay. Okay, thank you. Maybe another question. Uh, uh, you know, we are trying to use a web-based version uh, across the site, uh, but, you know, web-based requires uh, very strong internet access. So can we use uh, this web-based version with a limited internet access? Well, I want to emphasize Hunet does not have a web version. So the web version I mentioned is a Polytech web version. I'm going to go to the Hunet website. Here we have Hunet Web. It's only a demo. This version of Hunet is still in development. Unfortunately, we made a lot of progress until about six years ago. And then we started to have more and more compatibility issues with our old Hunet 5.6. So what you see here as a Hunet Web version is work that we did around six years ago. It's been on the back burner for a very long time. And at that time, I did have two programmers. Adam was working on the web version and I had a different programmer working on the desktop version that Grant ended. So we had to focus on the desktop version. So we have, I am very pleased to say that about two weeks ago, we have finalized our modernization upgrade. Um, we, we modernized different things at different points. We finished most of the modernization 
for Hunad about three years ago. We finished it for Backlink last year. There were some small details, but important details for compatibility that we fixed in the last two months. Um, it has to do with the technology called DAO that finally we were able to get rid of. So now what I'm very happy to say is we have now caught up. So now we are gonna focus not on the web version because we have other things to do first. Our first priority are the standard reports I described to you. Standard reports, okay. authorization scores. So what I'm basically saying is that maybe in about three months, we can start to make the web version a priority for development again. We had a, we had a programmer last year for a year, uh, and we only had money for a year, so I told her we have money for you for one year, and she helped us to finally modernize Backlink. If we had money, I'd love to bring her back again before she, she's still available, she has a job, but she would love to come back to us. So, so I would love to have two programmers, but with only one programmer, we always constantly have to juggle. So I'm hoping in July, or not July, this is too early, but in about three months, that we can finally make a serious attempt to go back to the web version. So in short, there is not a web version of Hunet at the present time. There's just this demo that we did that we can highlight sort of the direction what we hope to accomplish. So at the present time, you do have a Polytech web version that is in the process of installation. I highly recommend people look into that web version, try to use it as much as possible, at EPHI, you can use it for microbiology data. Uh, for Tiger Lion, they can use it for everything that's in the system. Everything that's in the system does not include uh, uh, microbiology. So I think the web version of Polytech will be a new opportunity to emphasize the importance of putting the microbiology results in the system. Polytech does have problems, but there would be such enormous benefit to utilizing it, recognizing its deficiencies. Don't try to use it for internal preliminary results and comments, but for the final results, the web version would be an additional incentive to try to get the results to clinicians all over the country who have username and passwords. Okay, you mentioned about quality of internet access. Um, of course, if the web system is down, the web system is down and nobody can do anything. If the web system is slow, that's in the, this question is how slow? You have to wait one minute or five minutes. Uh, sometimes if you wait too long, it'll time out and it will give up. Uh, one way to handle this is to strengthen, a lot of systems have a timeout of one minute. If it doesn't work in one minute, it cancels. What you may want to do is change the timeout to three minutes just to give the system a bit more time to catch up. Okay. What we plan to do for Hunet for data entry with our web version, and a lot of systems have this, is they have data entry of two types. There's online data entry or offline data entry. When internet access is poor, offline data entry makes a good sense as a good option. Basically, you go to the web page. If the web is down and you click on save, the data gets saved locally. And then the data gets saved locally. And then when the re internet re submission is reestablished, it'll resynchronize itself. So even if the internet is completely down, that should not hopefully in a good system with local capability of storage. If the web is, if the web is completely down, you would hope that you could do manual data entry. It gets saved locally in the short term. And once the internet connection is reestablished, then it gets transmitted over. So this is one strategy for dealing with unreliable internet connectivity is to have offline data storage. I also want to distinguish between there are very different needs of a web system for data entry and data retrieval. Usually data entry is only like two or three or four people. So those two or three or four people need to enter the data into the web system, ideally with this idea of a local store of data that can be synchronized. So for them, if the internet is down, they can continue to enter their data, which will be synchronized later. So one aspect of a web system is to facilitate data entry for three or four people who are responsible for data entry. But then in terms of data access, the physicians are not entering data. They simply want to look the results up. So for them, there is no, there's no problem about internet being down for data storage because those people are not doing data storage. The problem for them is they cannot do their data retrieval if the web is down. So you just want to distinguish these different needs. For data entry with bad connectivity, make sure you can do offline data entry and then resynchronize when the internet is established, the internet is reconnected. And that's relevant for the three or four people doing data entry. 
for data retrieval, then those people are not entering data. They simply need to retrieve the results and they just have to wait until the internet is back or just give them a longer delay before the time out happens. Uh, you know, sometimes it's frustrating. You'll get like half of the page loaded and then it times out. You may want to change that to time out of three minutes or five minutes just to give it more time to load the page. Does, I hope those comments help. Yeah, uh, thank you. There are things that I personally have no expertise in. Sometimes you'll have multiple mirrors. You'll have five, you'll have like three copies, three mirror copies. So if the internet connection with server number one is bad, it can automatically switch to server two. You know, internet works generally that way, not, not because the internet is down, but just to make it faster. You know, there, there are copies of the internet, mirror copies of many things all over. So we'll try computer number one. If computer one is busy, they'll just move it over to computer three. But this is obviously more advanced. Okay, other questions? If no other questions, I'll just go back to data entry. And we've finished about one hour, a little bit over one hour, just as a time check. Back to my PowerPoint. Um, let me move this and let me put this back in full screen. Move this. I'm trying to move the GoToMeeting uh, little window without accidentally disconnecting myself. Okay. Uh, so data entry. After you click on after when it just asked you, do you want to save the isolate and continue with the new a new specimen, or save the isolate and continue with the same specimen? For example, if you have a blood with two or three bacteria, it's the same patient, the same location, the same sample, but the microbiology is different. So in this case, when it doesn't ask you to re repeat everything, they just ask you to put in the new microbiology results. Or the last option, save the isolate and continue with the same alert, the same patient. That meaning that uh, the patient might have a blood and a urine and a wound. So it's the same patient, probably the same location, uh, but a different sample and different microbiology results. The isolate that I just ha entered has no alerts. So on this screen, it's a nice simple screen and there are no alerts. If there are alerts, the alerts would appear at the bottom of the screen and we'll see that in a few more slides. I will click on continue. So here is, again, if we were in person doing a practical demonstration, I would ask you to manually enter these results. It's the same patient, the same blood, but it's not a staph aureus, it's an E. coli. And then, um, right, first I'll show you on screen, and here you see the alerts. This is E. coli, and it is imipenem resistant. It says that on the screen, Enterobacteriaceae, non-susceptible to carbapenems. That is an example of a high priority alert. In the lower left-hand corner, you see there's a low priority alerts, medium priority alerts, and high priority alerts. I will now return to the previous screen. Data entry. WhoNet has about 190 alerts that warn you of possible typing or laboratory testing errors that should be confirmed. For example, in this example, it is resistant to ceftriaxone, which is a medium priority alert, possible ESBL producer. There's also imipenem resistant, which is a high priority alert. So I will go back to the next screen. So, um, this is very valuable for finding mistakes. Maybe the person was trying to type, you know, uh, 22, but they accidentally typed 12. So it might be a typing mistake, or it might be that they put the imi they put the ampicillin result into the imipenem column. They just put the antibiotic in the wrong antibiotic. So it's helpful to find typing mistakes. It's also helpful to find laboratory test mistakes. Like Klebsiella pneumonia is almost always ampicillin resistant. It's a characteristic of the species. Klebsiella pneumonia can be ampicillin sensitive. It is rare, like maybe 1%, 2%, 3% of the time. So Klebsiella pneumonia can be ampicillin sensitive. But if you do see Klebsiella ampicillin sensitive, I would not tell the doctor unless if I confirmed it. Is it really a Klebsiella pneumonia? And is it really ampicillin resistant? So when HUNA gives these quality control alerts, it does not mean there is any mistake, but it means there might be a mistake and the laboratory should double check it. So HUNA has high priority, medium priority, and low priority alerts. So do, well, let me take that back. So um, HUNA has high priority alerts, high priority, there's, and HUNA has high priority species, 
or important species, important resistance. The three main kinds of alerts of HUNET are important species, important resistance, and quality control. An example of an important species would be high priority Vibrio cholera, Salmonella typhi. Um, high par or medium priority, Salmonella enteritidis, um, uh, MRSA. So these are important species or important resistance. CRE is a high priority resistance. VRSA is a high priority resistance. MRSA, ESBL, VRE are medium priority resistance. And then you have the quality control alerts like Klebsiella sensitive to ampicillin, um, you know, Serratia sensitive to ampicillin. Or if you have an E. coli that is ampicillin sensitive, amoxicillin clavulinic, oh, oh, well, let me give a different example. If, if you have a bacteria that is ampicillin sensitive, but ampicillin cell bactam resistant, that doesn't make any sense. If it is ampicillin sensitive, it should also be resistant. If it is sensitive to ampicillin, it should also be sensitive to the combination of ampicillin to solbactam. Solbactam is there to help, not to hurt it. So if you have an E. coli sensitive to ampicillin but resistant to ampicillin plus solbactam, that's a quality control resu result. It doesn't make sense. If you have a bacteria sensitive to ampicillin but resistant to imipenem, that doesn't make sense. But these things that don't make sense do happen. And the most common reason is some mistake. For example, imipenem disc is not a sensitive disc. In a hot tropical environment, it tends to degrade, it tends to dissolve. So on, you might have a piece of, you might have an antibiotic disc that says imipenem on it, but there might not be any imipenem in it if the imipenem is all deactivated. Or instead of having 10 micrograms of imipenem, maybe there's only eight or seven or three because it's been deactivated or if it's a poor quality manufacturer disc. So you do see these strains that are ampicillin sensitive, imipenem resistant, but it is not true. There's some mistake. Somebody measured wrong, the disc is a bad quality, some other mistake. So the purpose of these alerts is either to find things that are of great public health importance or infection control importance or data quality importance. So Vitec and Phoenix and Microscan do have similar alerts, but HUNET is better in two ways. Vitec and Phoenix, their alerts are more about data quality. If you have Klebsiella sensitive to ampicillin, the Vitec will give an alert. But if you have a CRE, the Vitec will not give an alert. As long as it's correct, it's correct. So the Vitec's purpose is to find quality mistakes. The purpose of Vitec is not to give you public health importance alerts. So these things are important, but that's not the Vitec's job. The Vitec's job is to tell you that the result is correct. So one advantage of the HUNET alerts is that they do have to do with public health and important clinical findings, not quality findings. HUNET has, a, has all of those. That's one advantage of HUNET's approach. The second approach of HUNET is that it's also part of data analysis. When you do the Vitec alerts, you can see those alerts one at a time, but you cannot do an analysis. You cannot summarize how many. You cannot do a query on alerts. You can do a query on patient ID and look up the results in one at a time, so an advantage of the HUNET alerts is that it's part of data entry, but it is also part of data analysis. So I'm going to go back to the preceding screen. No, I already did that. And then when you save it, so again, in the upper right-hand corner, if I click on Save Isolate, it will summarize the alerts. Important resistance. You see those alert section. There are three, the first three are the ones I want to focus on. Quality control alert, important species alert, or important resistance alert. The other ones are more subjective, you know, but the first three are, you know, are the more important ones. And then those alerts are summarized at the bottom of the screen. So a few minutes ago, I showed you this screen, which is exactly the same screen for a boring bacteria with no alerts. This is now exactly the same screen, but the bacteria is more interesting and it gives you these alerts, helpful to find mistakes or important findings. We'll now continue. And I don't want to spend too much time on this. In the manual, in an interactive workshop, we, you can ask the people, please enter the results on the screen here. Um, okay. I'll skip over that example. I'll show that during the live demo. Here's an example that HUNET can also handle quality control. The patient's number and name is a very special name, ATCC25922. ATCC means American Type Culture Collection. 
these are QC strains that come off, that you purchase, that get shipped in, that are part of quality control of normal test practices. I visited one laboratory. Oh, was, I was just so embarrassed for them. They did not realize that they really did not know what they were doing. I looked at their clinical data and 15% of their clinical data were Staph aureus vancomycin resistant. So they had 15% vancomycin resistant Staph aureus. I said, that's not possible. It's impossible. Vancomycin resistant Staph aureus almost does not exist in the world. Um, uh, in the United States, in the last 20 years, only 16 people have had this confirmed. So VRSA is almost non-existent in the world. So it should be 99.99% sensitive. The fact that 15% of theirs were resistant said this is something not right. They're making a mistake here. And I, I was very glad to see that they did put all of the QC results into HUNET. And 20% of the QC strain was vancomycin resistant. And they told me, John, yes, our QC strain has become very resistant. And I think to myself, self, you people have no idea what a QC strain is. The QC strain does not become resistant. You purchased it. It wasn't resistant when you took it off of the, when you picked it up in the mail room, it's still not resistant. So HUNET can help you with the QC. So HUNET knows the correct measurements. So for example, for the QC strain, they have 16, 22, 18, and HUNET will tell you uh, somewhere in here, you see on the right-hand side of the screen for imipenem, the result is out of QC range. So I do encourage you to ask labs to enter the QC results. That serves two purposes. One is it tells you that they are doing QC. Because uh, sometimes they tell you that they do QC, but if you ask them to enter it, you can see how often they do it. Uh, and let's just assume they're not lying. Of course, it is easy to cheat on QC. You can say, oh, I know what the result is supposed to be. Let me just enter the QC. So I don't want people to lie. It, it is, a lot of times they feel it as a critique that they did something wrong. There is, if the result is not correct, if they feel strongly about the quality of the care they give to doctors, if the QC gives bad results, there is a problem. A lot of times the problem is not their fault. If they, if they purchase bad quality media and bad quality discs, if these discs are stored poorly, that's a problem. It's not a problem you want to hide. It's a problem you want to resolve. Um, so some people do QC once every three months, uh, once a month. Uh, the CLSI recommendation is a bit excessive, uh, but a, a lot of people try to do QC of three bacteria, Staph aureus, E. coli, and Pseudomonas at least once a week or at least once every two weeks. Uh, and it depends on what you agree as a network, what would be a good strategy for doing the QC testing. And then this allows you to see, first of all, are they doing the testing? Are they entering the results? That's goal number one. And then you can give them a score. How often did you do QC testing? That's one score. And then the other score is how good were the QC results? Are they in range or the out of range? And if they're getting bad results, don't blame the lab. It's, it's basically there is some problem that we need to investigate and fix. And then that's where you start to see problems. Maybe their inoculum is wrong. Maybe the medium is too thick or maybe the medium is too thin. If the medium is too thick, then the antibiotic diffuses down instead of horizontally. So you end up with smaller zone diameters. If the medium is too thin, then the antibiotic diffuses out a lot more and the zone diameters are bigger. So the whole, the whole purpose of QC is to help the lab do good quality testing. So HUNET allows you to put the QC in. The HUNET does can tell you if it's in range or out of range. Okay. Here in the upper right-hand corner, second option there is view database. So I click on view database. And you can see, I see all the data, those four isolates that we just entered. I can edit an isolate to look at them one at a time. Edit the table if I just want to edit this table directly manually. Um, or if the doctor is calling, I get a call from Dr. Smith, and Dr. Smith is telling me, I'm in the lab, and the doctor's saying, is I want to know the results for my patient. Here's the patient's name, date of birth, or the patient number. Somebody in the lab can look at the screen and just look at the results on the screen. There's some things we do want to make this easier, like HUNET doesn't have a filter. We will make a filter on the screen, which will make it easier to do that. We'll probably also replace this with just sort of a manual lookup, you know, um, so that you don't have to look at all the people at once. So, so I described a situation, the doctor will call, you can use this to give the patient results. We're gonna add on to this a few utilities to make that even easier by putting in some filters and allowing for individual patient lookup. You know, for example, it says fine, 
Right now, when you do find, it looks at the table, but it would be nice if it could switch to a different kind of display. The, the other option on the screen, well, there's delete. If you, you know, entered it twice, you can just delete the second one, or you can print. And the print is probably the next thing. So you can sort the data, edit the isolate, edit the table. I don't want to spend more time on that. It'd be easier in the manual data entry. Delete, search, print, et cetera. Okay, then clinical reports. Um, how much more? Okay, some people use WhoNet to report back to clinicians. Uh, some people enter into WhoNet all results, positive and negative. Of course, that would be great for statistics. How many bloods do we do? You know, uh, you know, WHO would like to know how many blood cultures did you do? I don't care if it's positive or negative. I just want to know how many you did. So it, there's an advantage if you put the positives and negatives in because it gives you more information about the laboratory's workload. On the downside, it's a lot more time for data entry. So labs just have to decide whether or not they want to enter everything, which will give them more analytical value, or just the positives. And the, just the positives is often a very reasonable compromise. It's just a question of how much time and effort does it take to put the negatives. A lot of times I recommend just start with the positives. If, if they want to know how many blood cultures we did, I'll just I'll look up our inventory and I'll give you an estimate. And don't use HUNET. I'll just tell you what we do approximately we do approximately 20 blood cultures a week, multiply by 52, and I'll give you an estimate for the year. So there is value to having the negatives in HUNET, but of course the amount of time for data entry is much greater. So each, I encourage, please enter at least the positives. If they can do that, then you can have the second question, can you also do the negatives? And a lot of places, I do have to say, only put the positives in. Um, but you know, for re reporting, if people use, what a lot of people do, if it's a negative report, they just uh, they don't put that into HUNET. They will just stamp the request form, they'll send the request form back, no growth, back to the clinician. Other people do put the negatives into HUNET, and then they print out a report. The report will send a growth, no growth, and they give that to the clinician. So that decision about what you enter is up to you. Okay, for, for your lives using Polytech, I'm trying to get people to try to use the Polytech because there are all of those other benefits. But for people without Polytech, then HUNET would be a good strategy for them for clinical reporting and storage. And you might only want to do the positives. That's a good way to start. And if it's not too much work, then ask them also to do the negatives. So you can print out the clinical report and uh, you have the, I'll skip over that. I'll just show you what the report looks like. Well, we didn't see it on this screen. Oh, okay. It actually in the slide said it does not show you what the report looks like. It's simple, it's basic, it's okay. Uh, you can customize on this screen. If you wanna put the header, the phone number, uh, the doctor's name, if you wanna put a signature row, Hunet will take care that middle section is called data fields. So Hunet will put the microbiology results. But if you want to put a signature row or the address of the hospital or a heading, and you can choose the font, you can do that. So you can customize the look of the print of the clinical report. The other thing that a lot of people do, so people doing Hunet for clinical reporting, sometimes edit here the report header. They'll put the name of the hospital, the address, the phone number. The footer, they'll put the name of the doctor in the signature row, and then the doctor, some, they'll print it out, there will be a line there for the signature, and then the doctor will sign the microbiology lab, the microbiology head will sign the paper. So a lot of people do that. What other people do is they have HUNET take care of the data fields, but instead of printing out onto a blank white piece of paper, they will print out onto hospital stationery. Um, I had some here on my desk. Um, where did I put that? Oh, here it is. Can you see me? I don't know if you can see me, but you know this is an example of stationery for my hospital. It has the name of the hospital at the top. It has some more things at the bottom. So a lot of labs like to do that because they can get a more professional printout. The top is beautiful with icons and logos and colors that they coordinate with the printers. At the bottom, there's the signature line. So a lot of people using HUNET for clinical reporting, a lot of them just print out onto a white piece of paper, but a lot of other people print out onto hospital stationery, which looks nicer. And finishing up, then you exit out of here, click on data entry. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, John. Did you try to show a, a clinical report? Because I didn't see that on my screen. Oh, okay. Well, I was, so there is none inside of my PowerPoint. Oh, uh, okay. Inside the PowerPoint, I do not have one. The person who made the slide set 
did not put one in and I have not, I don't use these slides yet myself usually. I just usually okay. use these live because I know it off the top of my head. But it is correct. It would be good to have an example of a clinical report here yeah. as part of the PowerPoint slides. Set. Okay. What I did try to show is, can you see me personally? Can you see? No. Oh, my camera. My camera's on, but I guess you cannot see me. That's okay. Just imagine this. I was holding up a piece of hospital stationery. Okay. <laughs> but, but John, we have uh, you know a very big problem with this hospital stationery, uh, especially in uh, the Kurambasa Hospital. So can the clinical report uses for uh, multiple of patients or just one patient? For example, one day report or monthly report or quarterly. How is the practice? How is the practice? Well, okay, but you're, there are two different reports you just mentioned. There is a patient report. You know, the doctor. You know, the doctor sends a sample of urine to the lab, and it's an E. coli, ampicillin resistant. You print out that clinical report. You can do one or two reports on a page in HUNET. If you do two reports on the page, you can cut the page in half to save paper. So that's a clinical report that you give back to the doctor, and then he can take care of the patient. That's a clinical report. The other kind of report is an analytical report. And the analytical reports, you can do weekly analyses, monthly analyses, quarterly analyses, or the annual report. So I, I, I've been talking in the last few minutes about the clinical yeah. report features, not about the analysis report features. Okay. I do want to, and I think I showed you this previously. Um, let's see if I can find it quickly. C drive. No, it's on my other. I haven't quite completely switched out with. Uh, no, that's not here. I, I think I've shown you before the reports from Japan and Vietnam. So yeah. I like the idea of having these pre formatted nice PDF files. So in the next few months, that's one of our main priorities in HUNET is to make these nicely formatted analysis reports that you could. So right now, HUNET does a lot of great analyses, but I usually like to clean it up in Excel or Word before I give it to people. It would be nice if HUNET could do a report that you could immediately give to other people. Okay. And that's the purpose of the Japan report and the Australia report. The, it's interesting the Vietnam report is very valuable, but it really is meant for the experts you don't you, it's a feedback report for that lab i would not give that to everybody because there's too much information it's not it's useful for data quality assessment it's not useful for discussion purposes for broad stakeholders so what we want are different reports with different stakeholders in mind the feedback reports the epidemiology reports and huna does all of these data analyses but right now it is often not in the best formatting to give to other people so in the next few months, you will see significant improvements in these areas. It is in fact what we plan to make our big priority starting this January. So I was hoping that we would have all this done, but that's when we encountered a big compatibility issue with DAO. So we lost two months basically modernizing. It's something we were planning on doing already, but we were kind of forced to do our modernization effort first. Now that that is finished, then uh, the, the next big priority are these reports. So the next two months, I think you'll see significant improvements in the report capabilities. You know, in some sites, uh, again, uh, uh, for database, they usually uh, resist to inter -negative, culture negative uh, results. Uh, do you think this is uh, not helpful for data analysis? What do you advise on this? Because there is always uh, this kind of. Uh, I was uh, commenting on this. Uh, I do. I I tell them about the modest benefit because they want to feel that their time is well spent. They want to yeah. feel that the, they have to choose ten different things. What is the best use of their times? And definitely, it is easy for them to understand. I hope the benefit of entering the positives. Yes, because that's the, yeah. the doctors want the epidemiology, the statistics, the surveillance, all of those things you need the positives. Regarding yeah. the negatives, I mentioned there are benefits to the negatives, but they are not enormous benefits. Um, so I don't push on the negatives. I do tell them the advantages of the negatives, but I don't make it, I, I don't, I want this to be sustainable. I want them to feel good about the project. I don't want them to protest. I want to make it as, I want them to feel that their time is well spent. If they feel that entering the staff in E. coli is a good use of time, great. That is our first objective. 
if they do not feel that entering the negatives is a good use of time, there are two things I do. Is I do explain the benefit of the negatives because they say, oh, I hadn't thought about that. Yes, I can see the value of the negatives. But after I explain that, I see, I see what you mean, but it's just not, it's too much time. In the case of yeah. blood cultures, typically 10% of the, 10% of blood cultures, of course, every hospital is different. About 10% of blood cultures are positive. About half of those are real positives. About half of those are contaminations. 90% are negative. So if you want to enter them negative, do you really want them to spend 90% of the time entering the negative results? The main value of having the negatives is to get a look at data volume, the workflow. How much work is the lab doing? Uh, are they doing 10 blood cultures a month? If it's positive or negative, it's another matter. If they're doing a hundred, if they're doing a hundred blood cultures a month, I want to know that. That's an important question. Whether it's positive or negative is a different important question. So if I want to know how many blood cultures a month they are doing, one way to do that is to have them enter the negatives. There is also another way, and it's just an estimate. You can just ask the lab about how many do you do a month, or maybe they have precise numbers because they have to do inventory. They purchase, they purchase the 150 blood cultures. They use the 100 of them. They have 50 left. So if your interest in, is in volume of processing and purchasing, um, like we want people to do more blood cultures. I don't care if it's positive or negative. That's a different question. If I see that now the lab is doing 10 blood cultures a month, I want to see they're now doing 30. They want to do 50. I do want to see the growth in blood cultures. One way to do that is to have them enter the negatives. The other way for them is to simply give you an estimate or, or an exact number based on inventory. You just ask them, please enter the positives into Hunet, but separately, just tell me how many blood cultures you did last month. That's often much, that gives you most of what you want in a much easier way. They will manually Sorry. enter all the positives, but the negatives, they're just giving you a total number. Okay, yes? thank you, John, thank you. Geneva wants you to enter the negatives for the WHO glass, but Geneva is not paying the labs. Uh, so we want this to be sustainable in a long period of time. Maybe they'll say, yes, we're happy to enter the negatives for the next two months, but we're busy. We have 20 different things. We have COVID to deal with, and it's, you have to judge what is sustainable. Of course, that's another advantage of an LIS, like if people enter manually the results into a system like, you know, what, what many places do is they will enter all samples into a system like Polytech. And that way, all the samples are in. And then when they finalize it, they'll still finalize the negatives in Polytech. So if people have an LIS, often the negatives will be there automatically. So these are things you can use to balance. So I want to do everything we can to optimize your system for collecting the positives. Collecting the negatives is sort of a longer term discussion. John. Yes? Was that the start of a question? If not, I will go back to the PowerPoint. Um, let's see, I need to move, go to meeting and put this back here. So here you see on the data entry screen, there's new data file, open data file. At the bottom of the screen, you see the most recent file, the one that we were just testing, listed. That just makes it easier for you to choose recent files. Uh, who not like uh, Excel and Word, I think they show you the most recent 20 files. Who not we show you the most recent four. Finishing up, okay, data entry, exit. And that's the end of, wow, that's, that's it's good. We went through a full PowerPoint. It's now 20 minutes before time, so I'm open to questions or a new subject. Hello, John, uh, I have a question, please. Yes. Yes? Uh, uh, from the quality control data, how can we enter a quality control data? Uh, as we know, we have uh, a guideline based on say uh, yeah. uh The quality control perform uh, new loads, new shipment, and then after weekly. So every week, we will have to enter a quality control data with the patient result, or is there any another mechanism to enter uh, quality control data? Sure, I will answer that now. I am now inside of Hunet. And I, I chose the WHO test hospital to demonstrate, to answer your question. I'm in data entry on the menu. I can choose new data file, open data file, or one of these files 
I had open recently. So if I go to new data file, uh, let me just call this junk.junk. .junk. You know, I do that a lot just because so I know I can delete it later. I'm going to put it on the C drive in the Hunet data folder, or as I said earlier, you could choose some other location for it, for example, a network drive. And here I'm inside of Hunet uh, data entry. Human, nice, human, animal, food, etc. Identification number. So uh, you have two choices. Uh, so you can put the the QC data in with the normal data, the clinical patient data, or you can make a separate file for it. It's easier if you just put them all together. And a lot of the lab data management people are not great with IT. A lot of them are not great with computers. So if they're not great with computers, I just suggest put the clinical bacteria and the QC bacteria all together. That way they go to the same file every day, they enter the patient results, they enter the QC results, they enter all those data together. Before I continue with data entry, I will go to data analysis. There's a feature in data analysis called isolates. Here, the second option, uh, the first option is exclude quality control. So even if you put all of the patient results and the QC results together, you can still analyze them separately. So HUNET automatically excludes the QC. Uh, so that way, when we do our annual statistics, we're not including the QC as part of those analyses. So if you put your QC and your patient data together, it is not a problem. HUNET allows you to separate them later when you get to data analysis. So the data entry will be easier for the data entry people if you put the clinical and the QC results together. That's particularly valuable when people are not really great with their IT skills. Alternatively, you know, you could have two files here. I could have one file for my clinical data and then a different file for my QC data. For people with good IT skills, often they would prefer to do that. The clinical data are here as a big file. The QC data are here as a small file. So it just depends on how good you feel about the IT skills of the staff. Uh, if you do put the QC in with the patient bacteria, not a problem. Hunet can keep them separate at the time of analysis. Okay, so here an identification number, I'm going to put a very special patient. Instead of patient 12345, the patient's number is ATCC25922. I will now hit enter. When it automatically tells you that the patient's first and last name is, QC, is ATCC. The specimen type is quality control. Specifically, it's an E. coli. If I put ATCC25923, that's a Staph aureus. So HUNET knows all of the standard QC strains. So here I am in data entry. Let me put it back to the E. coli. So ampicillin, I click inside of ampicillin. Normally on the right-hand side of the screen. So I'm going to change this from QC to blood. If this is blood and I go to ampicillin, I see, well, it still knows it's a QC. Uh, but anyway, um, because of the ATCC. But let me do it. Let me just uh, let me just uh, save the isolate. No, uh, click clear. Start from the beginning. Okay. If I go one, two, three, four, five, and I go to E. coli, I go to my E. coli panel. So here you see 14 to 16. That's the intermediate interpretation range. So if I put a clinical bacteria, this is going to be the intermediate RIS ranges. It's the interpretation categories. However, if I change this to a QC string, I'm trying to change the, there, ATCC25922, it is not telling me the interpretation range, it's telling me the QC range. So anything between 15 and 22 is the expected result. If I have a, so if I put ampicillin 20, sensitive, continue. But if I put ampicillin 6, you see this symbol here, the at symbol, and that means the result is out of the QC range. So who is telling the person uh, in one way to be cynical? I'm sort of helping the person to cheat. But if they're going to cheat, they have a lot of other ways to cheat because they already know what the QC range is supposed to be. But who is telling you that this value is out of range? So I'm going to now go to save the isolate, save the isolate, and then I continue with the next one. Then when I view my database and I look over at the the first and last name is ATCC, and the specimen type is QC. So HUNET can separate those at the time of data analysis. Uh, does that answer the question? 
Yeah, it's clear and thank you. Sure. What they do in Argentina, because Argentina is always one of our model countries that have been doing this a long time, is they give people scores. They score people on how many strange results do you get? And again, strange does not mean wrong, but strange often does mean wrong. Uh, so a lot of times at the beginning, like in the Philippines, they looked at strange results and they had a lot of strange results. With feedback, the number of strange results decreased significantly. There were still strange results that were usually true. So once they know what is strange and not strange, then they can do a better job of fixing their own data. So the total number of strange results in the Philippines went significantly down, but the proportion that were confirmed went up. So, so Argentina, they score people. They score people on percent strange results. They score people on completeness of data, uh, and they score people on compliance with the QC protocol. Their agreement is to test the ATCC, E. coli staff, and Pseudomonas every, uh, every two weeks. So at the end of every month, they should have two QC E. coli, two QC staph aureus, two QC pseudomonas, and that's part of their score. In fact, in the Philippines, they've done a really nice job there, is they have an annual meeting, and every year they get a variety of scores, and they have to give a presentation, and they put a poster together, or a PowerPoint, and they get scored on a lot of things, completeness of testing, quality of results, discussion with the infection control team, interventions you've done, and then whoever has the highest score gets a, a, a prize. The prize is often a free laptop or something else. So by putting in these scores, it just helps to incentivize people to look at their progress, identify the deficiencies. By making it this in this friendly, competitive way, uh, it, you know, it's nice to give pe recognize people for their work. Um, the same lab cannot win two years in a row. <laughs> Otherwise, you may end up with the same lab winning every year. Uh, and it's not only about the data. It's, it, it, they include, they get a score for data completeness. They get a score for the efforts they've done with their pharmacy. Have you had a stewardship program? Have you had an infection control thing? Give examples of what you have done with antibiotic resistance. They also get scored on their EQA program. There's a national EQA program. So you may want to think about this. It's sort of thinking about the long term, about how to build a network and the fact that the Philippines bribed their people with a free laptop is a nice incentive. Okay, uh, and it doesn't have to be that. It can be other things that are not so, it, sometimes just a certificate. Uh, you know, it's a free thing, but it is recognized. You did the best in this year, you know, for the QC or something like that. Um, you don't want to recognize people's bad quality. You don't want to punish people. You work with them individually on the deficiencies. But people who do amazing work, they do appreciate it to be recognized for it. I gave you a long answer for a short question. <laughs> okay, we have about 10 minutes left. What would you like to discuss now? I mean, as long as we're on the screen, uh, I, I do want to emphasize the importance of configuration of panels. Here I'm on, here I see all antibiotics. But if I put Steph Aureus, I just see Steph, you see the list has gotten shorter. Let me change that again, blank. So here I have all the antibiotics, but if I change this to Steph Aureus, I only see the staph drugs. If I put E. coli, I put the E. coli drugs. Pseudomonas, I see the Pseudomonas drugs. Or I can just say all antibiotics, or I can say staph. I can also choose it and force it to be a certain set. I mentioned that because we are still inside of data entry. But the panels, you do not define the panels during data entry. You define the panels. I'm going to click on exit and I slip no. File, modify lab. I would go back to configuration. Antibiotics. On the right, you see the list of all antibiotics. There are 43 antibiotics. Here under panels, you can see with the different checkboxes, which are the different antibiotics that go with the different species. If it's a staphylococcus, these are the drugs I want to see. If it's a gram negative, these are the drugs I want to see. So by being careful about this, I'm just going to do this a bit randomly. Well, completely randomly. So you can decide what I'm going to cancel, safe changes, no. So that is the panels. Let me go back to panels. If I go to staph aureus. So if I say staph aureus, it's now showing me only the panel drugs. So even though this concept is controlled by configuration, 
it is used by data entry to make the life of the data entry person easier. For people using back think this is not important because they're doing data entry in a different system. But for people using manual data entry, these panels are very valuable. Other questions? Uh, Gabriel and team, if there aren't uh, further questions right now for the data entry um, topic, then do you have some suggestions what you would like to go to next week? And is it is the timing appropriate to do a national configuration, uh, you know, a topic on national nationally configuring uh, WhoNet to facilitate data analysis? Over. Yeah, maybe uh, I can say something about uh, the national configuration. Uh, before you do that one, I would suggest maybe uh, the different kind of data analysis uh, that you can show on us. That will be presented first, then later on, we can see the national configuration. Right, so there are two ways to do this. I agree we should focus on data analysis. There are two ways we can do that. I can show you data analysis using my standard WHO data, which will introduce everything. And then after that session, then we switch to the Ethiopian data. So that's one strategy. The other strategy is I teach you all of data analysis, but I don't show you my data. I just use your data to begin with. So basically, we could have one session on data analysis, you know, one initial discussion about data analysis, the question is that in the initial discussion of data analysis, do you want me to do that with my data or do you want me to do it with your data? Uh, maybe uh, I can provide uh, the data, but uh, you know our data is small. Yes. Uh, maybe if you have a big data, uh, that would be better to use it, uh, the WHO one. If the WHO okay. one is bigger. Uh, what I don't have is big data, but when we distribute WhoNet, I give you everybody, I mean, it's right here. Uh, so if I go to save isolate data analysis, when we give people WhoNet, uh, just ignore it. There are four files here, just ignore three of them. Uh, this file here is called W0195. These are data from January, 1995. So this one month of data is what we give to people to, to play around with. There are 622 bacteria in it. So um yeah sure I'll, I'll show so I'll, based on i'll base the presentation on my data the question is whether to show ethiopian data at the same time or leave that for the following presentation now let's do it that way for the next one i will do a standard normal who analysis presentation using my data and then on the following call we will switch to ethiopian data yeah that's great okay i'm gonna leave this uh there's one important point for data entry that I did skip over. And since we have a couple of minutes, I do want to get to it. I showed you data entry and I want to open this junk file. And there it is and view my database. And that's what we just entered today. So you see how easy it is to use this open data file or choose one of these files at the bottom. That's easy. But I'm going to show something a little that people can get confused. I'm going to go to modify lab and I'm going to add two more drugs. I'm going to add, um, you know, let me add Ampicillobactam and let me add Tigacycline. Okay. And I'm going to go to data fields, modify the list, and I'm going to add, for example, um, the patient diagnosis and the name of the physician. So you can see how I just used my configuration to add two more antibiotics and I added two more data fields. I'm now going to try to open that junk file that I created half an hour ago. Hunet is telling me there's something has changed here. The data file and the configuration are a bit different. What do you want to do? I could just continue with data entry, but I'm going to say review the differences. Why are they different? Hunet is now telling me your configuration has two more antibiotics and two more data fields, but your data file doesn't have those fields because it just added them. So you here in the lower left-hand corner, I'm gonna say add fields to the data file. Do you want to add the missing fields to the data file? Yes, I do. The additional fields have been added. So now you see diagnosis and physician appear on the screen. Episol, Bactim, and Tegacycline appear at the bottom. So I just wanted to raise this to you as a concept. 
I, not that you'd be experts at it, but this this doesn't happen often, but because because people don't usually add, add information, they have a configuration, they're happy with it. But if you add more antibiotics and add more data fields, and you try to open up one of the files that already exists, Huna will ask you, do you want to add those additional columns to the database? So it's just a way to keep them in synchronized. When I showed you this demonstration half an hour ago, take a site and an back and we're not on the list. Diagnosis and physician were not on the list. So there was that message about review the differences that allowed me to add them. That's all the time we have to say about that, but it's, you're just aware of it. So if somebody sees this message, this is different. Do you want to review the differences? This does not mean there's an error. It means somebody simply added something. You've added something to the configuration. Hunet is simply asking you, do you also want to add it to the data file? So I just want to leave this as a concept. Uh, you will come this across in the future, uh, but don't be worried about it. There's a very simple explanation. There is no mistake. Huna just wants to know if you want to keep these things synchronized. Okay. Yeah, maybe one question regarding this one. Yes. Uh, suppose you have two data files coming from two configurations. Yes. Uh, maybe the configuration, the configurations, they differ uh, by, let's say, two variables. Yep. Uh, one one of the variables uh, was actually user-defined user variables, but they are telling us the same thing. Uh, you understand, John? So in the interest of time, um, yes, what I just showed you allows you to synchronize them. Uh, I suggest that maybe the first thing we do on the next call is talk about that. Okay, that's good. Okay. Yes, it is also related to this idea of making a national configuration. So we can do that at the beginning of the next call.